went home very slowly and was careful afterwards never to be cheeky to Gordon again. <laughs> there we are. That's the end of that story. Did you enjoy that story? Yes. Yes, it was lovely. I wonder if I can squeeze in, find a space Come amongst on, this crowd. Come on, sit down here. They were so intent on that story, watching <coughs> and listening, they were glued to every word. But this must bring back memories for you, doesn't it? Because didn't it all start when you actually told stories to your own son? Yes. That was nearly 40 years ago. My little boy was three when I told, first told him that story. And you know... My little boy is 41 years old now. He's a great big boy. And he's got a little boy of his own. And does he tell that story to his own son? I expect so. Yes. Well, let's go back to your own childhood, because didn't you live near a railway line and imagine stories and conversations amongst the trains that oh, you heard? Yes from about 1916 to 1928. We lived in a house quite close to the main railway line between um, Bath and Chippenham. And lying in bed at night, I would hear goods trains coming into Box Station and they go beep, beep, beep for the banker. And there was an engine kept at Box Station. And you could come out of its shed and push, uh, push on behind. And then the two engines would push the heavy train up the hill into Box Tunnel. And I used to hear the engines talking to each other. The what banker, the, uh, the train engine would say, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And the banker coming up behind a little, uh, little pannier tank, 5700, would say, oh, yes, you can, oh, yes, you can, oh, yes, you can, oh, yes, you can. And they would come, I can't do it, I, oh, yes, you can, I can't do it, oh, yes, you can, until they, uh, so you couldn't hear them quarrelling anymore and they uh, got into Box Tunnel. And that gave me the idea that steam engines were like people and they could talk to each other. And they could talk to us if only we understood their language. But let me ask you about the modern engines because these children don't see steam engines very much. They see no. diesels and they see electric trains. But you didn't write about those, even no. though you were still writing the books ten no, years ago. I Why? Didn't, uh... What's wrong with them? Well, they, they, they're... They're dull. They haven't got any personality. Steam engine, whether it's working hard or whether it's standing quietly, has always got something to say. It's always, even Hagley Hall, staying, standing quietly there, you can hear it just uh, cooing away quietly and happily to itself. It's contented, but, uh, isn't it? But a diesel has got nothing to say except a sort of, well, self-satisfied purr. <laughs> Or a growl, if it's not pleased at all. <laughs> They're not such and, nice creatures at all. And electrics, especially the, the, the London Underground, they're rather like worms. They live in holes, and you've got the feeling that like a worm, you could cut it in half and it wouldn't mind. <laughs> It'd grow... Uh, it'll grow a separate end each, each way. <laughs> Diesel, there's another thing about diesels. They're two-faced. Really? Yes. You know what two-faced people are like? You never know. You can't trust them. 
Well, I think in that case we better not talk about them anymore. No. Because I think there are lots of uh, little faces here who would love to hear another story. Would you like another story? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Have you got another story in there? Yes. I think this is the point where I will tiptoe away. I'll listen round the back, but I'll let you carry on with your story. Yes. Out I go. There were a small coach, some flat trucks, and two queer things his driver called cranes. That's the breakdown trains of his driver. When there's an accident, the workmen get into the coach and the engine takes them quickly to help the hurt people and to clear and mend the line. 